I would now like to request Mr. Rashid Bashi, board member and partner, Public Sector Consulting, Deloitte Middle East, to share his thoughts on national transformation strategy. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Aswar, and the Nutshell um, Conference for um, inviting me for the second time. Last time I came here was in 2017 for the Leaders in Islamabad Summit. And I spoke about CPAC and how CPAC could be uh, a catalyst for economic transformation for Pakistan. And at the time, I think politically, you were going through um, Panama Papers and there was uncertainty uh, in the country. And I think uh, while I was preparing for my remarks, um, on the plane I was thinking I'm, I'm gonna say that there is a renewed optimism with the new government. But by the time I landed, I think that was a bit more uncertainty and some nervousness, I think, it's fair to say, that there are some challenges facing the country in terms of uh, economic um, stability. And I think that is the context in which uh, I would share my views on uh, some economic and social transformation and how other countries uh, have taken um, a bold approach and a concerted effort to transform their economies and societies. And I was talking to Aswar in um, Dubai a few months ago when I shared with him the work that we as Deloitte, as a firm, are doing for countries in the Middle East uh, and also in Europe, in the US and elsewhere on helping nations either transform their overall national economies or their sectors such as transport, infrastructure, education, healthcare, or also sometimes defense as well. And if when I look at the Pakistan context and in which there is a need for a clear national economic narrative. So any economic transformation strategy and a plan starts with a narrative. And the narrative is, what are you going to be known for? What is going to be defining Pakistan in the global economic value chain in the global economic context? So General Saab gave a very um, elaborate and very comprehensive uh, view of the security cha landscape changing globally. There are demographic trends, there are technology changes, and there are opportunities as a result of that. So we have transitioned from the, ind the second industrial revolution to third, and now we're entering the fourth industrial revolution, which is artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, IOT, and people are already talking about the Society 5.0, which will be how people will live going forward and how the technology will change the way economies function, the way societies function. So I think if you look at this kind of macro context of geopolitics, demographic change, as well as the technology change, there is an opportunity for nations like Pakistan to leapfrog others if we get our act together and have clarity of purpose. So there are going to be things that we will be doing. There is a kind of uh, economic sectors. There are consumption driven sectors, housing. You've got local services. But what will really change the future of Pakistan is what are you going to export? What are export-oriented, tradable goods and services that Pakistan will be competitive in? You are not working in, in the global economy in isolation. It is a very competitive environment. You need to work harder and run faster to catch up. And if you run, but others are running faster, then clearly it is not going to be a catch up. It will be distance will keep on growing. And when we advise governments on transformation, the first thing, as I said, is clarity of purpose. 
very clear view on society, economy, and place. What kind of economy Pakistan will have? Which sectors it will specialize in? Which sectors it will drive economic growth in? And then working backwards from there, what kind of skills do you need? There is no point talking about fourth industrial revolution and our ability to benefit from this if our schools don't have computers, if illiteracy rate is 40%, right? If our best universities and if best colleges in Pakistan are nowhere in the top 500 globally, top 100 globally. So set the ambition high, very clearly then very specifically go after education system reform. Go after your um, macroeconomic reform. Go after your ease of doing business reform. Now we talk about ease of doing business. There are things governments can do with very little money. It doesn't take long to remove regulation or change regulation. It doesn't cost money. It just needs understanding and again, clarity of purpose. If you are clear that you are going to be leaders in sector X, Y, and Z, then say, what are we going to do to compete and beat other neighbors and other nations in the region and globally? For example, when China decided to do that it will become the factory of the world, now they're obviously in a different place, right? When they started off, it was very clear, we want to be the factory of the world. They made it easier for people to manufacture in China. Malta, very small, tiny nation, no natural resources, decided they are going to be world leaders in gaming and computer industries. And again, they are putting concerted effort in that. Dubai decided to be tourism hub. Now, everything Dubai does is geared towards tourism. Tourism, trade, and travel, right? Everything they do is geared towards that. Although there are other things happening there, but the focus where, where they, they drive economic growth, where they drive economic performance is through that. What is it gonna be for Pakistan? That's kind of number one. Once you have decided what that is going to be, then it is about relentless focus on implementation, on execution. And this is where governments get it wrong sometimes, where very good um, intentions, great plans, poor execution. And again, when you are looking at your execution plans, it is very clear that you have your goals, objectives, your targets, your KPIs, and then funding and financing comes last. And then in funding and financing, you also need to look into what the private sector can do for you. Governments cannot and run economies, generally speaking, and even in um, certain countries where it is command and control mechanism, even there, there is a great realization that governments cannot run economies. It is tough. Let the private sector, let the civil society unleash its potential to, to help you deliver and drive economic growth. So from execution perspective, there are also cross-functional, cross-ministry, efforts that need to take place. So one of the mistakes people make is very good education reform plan, very good healthcare reform plan, very good economic development plan, but there is no coordination, collaboration. So some work we are doing in, in some country in the region where they wanted to do reform education to, to get the economy moving. There are 90 initiatives, 50 key ministries and stakeholders 
and cross-cutting initiatives to get things done. It is not only one ministry trying to do its own uh, transformation and reform. You have to work together and collaborate. And then what you need to do is ensure that you put your economic strategy at the heart of your national agenda. And once that happens, then there are a number of things you can do to ensure that you leverage all your assets to drive that change. So let me give you one example. If you know there are countries in the region and globally going through certain transformations, and you know the example of China and their Belt Road Initiative, and Pakistan happens to be in the right place to benefit from that, hopefully. Um, but actively seeking what else is happening in the region. For example, the Saudi Vision 2030, they want to transform their economy. What can Pakistan do to help them? Beyond Afradi Kuwait, right? That's not the only asset you have. Yeah? Is our embassy there looking at opportunities, engaging with ministries in back home? talking to business community, saying, guys, this is what's happening there. What can you do to come and benefit from the opportunity? Yep, what Pakistani big companies, small companies are going to go and help achieve that vision. There are, everybody in the world is coming there to support them. Uh, what is your mission in that country, for example? What is your mission in the regional, uh, uh, economic play that's taking shape and then leveraging your economic, your military, your intelligence, your embassy and diplomatic resources, focus on that. So everybody is singing from the same page that you are going to drive change, you're going to drive economic performance and you're going to deliver outcomes for your people in a coordinated and in a concerted manner. So in terms of where you want to focus, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you what Pakistan's benefit, Pakistan's advantages are, and that is where, from a process point of view, you start with analyzing your strengths and weaknesses, your opportunities. You then start engaging with your stakeholders and have consensus on non-negotiable economic path. I think if you can do national action plan, I'm sure you can do national economic plan. A national economic plan should then drive what are the, going to be the key initiatives, what are the key themes, how are you going to implement those themes. And I will now touch on one sector as an example how, when we talk to our, our um, clients and governments, how do we actually help and support them? And education, is the, is the education minister is here, I would kind of spend five minutes on education as an example of how you may want to consider some of these uh, reforms, for example. First of all, you know in literacy rate is, is low, access is low, you need 200,000 new schools to get 100% access to start with. Then you have challenge with curriculum. You have challenge with teacher motivation. You have challenge with teacher recruitment. You have challenge with parent engagement in, in school system. So you know your challenges. You know where you need to get to. And that is only to set the basics right. Then you have the changes in the global economic landscape. You have changes in technology coming up, for example. And then you need to kind of say one eye on delivering basic to everybody, then lifting the kind of curriculum and then getting to globally competitive education system where you produce the best use cases of robotics, of AI. Because problems are here in this country and Pakistan could be a test bed for those test cases and use cases, right? So once you have that vision from basics to the top, then you go, okay, how I'm going to do, deal with my provinces given the 18th amendment, how I'm gonna build consensus about getting education moving in the right direction. 
after that consensus of where you want to get to, then you say, okay, I want in the next 10 years, I know it is difficult to think about 10 years when uh, economic and social agenda is driven by 24 hour news cycle and five year election cycles, it's difficult. But these reforms are painful and difficult. You can't do in five years, in two years. It's a 10 year plan. So everybody is on board on that plan. Then you say, okay, I am going to improve my rankings on TIMS and PISA score internationally. I want to ensure when the World Bank produces its report of competitiveness, I want my human capital index to improve to this level. So everybody knows we have a way here, we need to get to there. Then how are you going to fund and finance this? And where is the role of private sector? And how are you going to engage? And we talk about the overseas Pakistanis. How are you going to engage that community, people engaged in that work, not only to contribute financially, but also their skill sets. They're, um, they are developing some really innovative stuff internationally. Khan Academy being one of them, right? Khan Academy in the US. There are other people doing really interesting things. How are you going to benefit from this? So that way, and then go after this. Have a delivery unit. Have a task force with proper governance, maybe led by the prime minister, with stakeholders meeting every, every two weeks. Then you look at all your uh, plans, dashboards, and also, when you are going for long-term reform, you need to get the permission to carry on doing the difficult and long-term things by delivering some quick wins. Engage your stakeholders and ensure they understand where you are. They understand very clearly it will be a 10-year journey. In year two, hold me accountable for the following five things. If I haven't delivered those five things, hold me accountable. But don't expect the year 10 outcome in year two, but I will deliver you year two outcomes in year two, year three, year four, year five. It isn't rocket science. It is very simple, very methodical. Uh, you need to put a methodology in place and go after this in that manner. And then you look at your universities. And I, I spoke about uh, fourth industrial revolution. There are two or three big universities in Pakistan, nuts, lumps, others. They're doing some very interesting things. How do you in ensure they become globally competitive? What is the policy and strategy to engage, get them working with some leading international universities? And then more importantly, how they can help other universities across the country, how every single university in Pakistan can benefit from what are the curriculum, the way the teaching is happening in the top universities. So those could be some of those initiatives. How are you going to engage with parents, for example? For example, and those could be, again, very specific things you do. And then finally, when you have challenges and you need to course correct, when things move, things change, then again engage your stakeholders. There are some things which Pakistan needs to do, which are, frankly, you have no choice. No matter what the economic change happens globally, you still have to educate your people to a basic level anyway, right? But then when things change in certain technologies and certain areas, then you course correct. And finally, you also engage with international and local business community to help them understand what you are doing is aligned with their labor force requirements in education space. Yep. And then have some case studies and some proof points that you have achieved the following. Look at what we did here. That has led to the following use case. And from there, this economic activity was uh, driven. And as a result, these jobs were created. So that is the level of detail I wanted to share with you my kind of perspective on how detailed it has to be for it to be impactful and for it to be measurable, for it to be meaningful. So going back to the point around um, use cases, Pakistan has got massive challenge with tax avoidance, right? There are new technologies out there around blockchain, around AI, around big data, through which you can actually go after some of those individuals. 
uh, who are pretty wealthy. They send their kids to international schools, five times holidays, but the income is kind of pretty low on their tax returns. How did you go after those people? So if Pakistan can crack that one, then you go internationally and sell it to everybody in the world. That this is how do you use AI. We have our own people who are AI experts. Yet yeah. they are also people who are absolutely capable of implementing the AI solution, working with regulations and regulators and government. We decided to do the following, and now look at the outcome. Right? For example, Nadra, when you guys did the kind of a national ID, that was kind of pretty successful. I understand. Number of other countries want to do, do the same thing. So why Pakistani companies and Pakistani firms and supported by, by the state, why are they not going after some of those opportunities internationally and actually going on the front foot from the point of view of economic diplomacy? Yeah, Pakistan matters, but it should not only matter from a security perspective, it should matter from an economic perspective too. The brains and the talent that is in this country should be leveraged to deliver some game-changing things in the world. There should be some IP coming out of Pakistan. It should not always be, you know, receiving the, 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 the technologies from outside. So you have some of the biggest problems right now. Water shortages, power shortages, tax avoidance, agriculture reform and lack of productivity, for example, right? So you can test some of those things here in a way that the world will benefit from that. If you could crack how to, the, the code for increasing productivity in ag agriculture, yeah, dealing with the challenges of pesticides, that will unleash economic prosperity in your rural communities. That will help feed the world, but also that can be a export-oriented technology play for you. Yeah, it doesn't have to be only in computers. It's how you use computers for solving those problems. And some countries in this region, by the way, are doing some of those things. And you have to keep an eye on that. Either learn from it and go a step ahead of it. So this is, I wanted to share with you, start with a clear vision. What is core focus of Pakistan going to be from economic perspective, drive your society behind it, reform your education accordingly, have your economic policies in place accordingly, leverage all your assets, including ec economic, military, and I say military because military manufacturing could also help civilian manufacturing as well, if you can combine the two. Yeah, and then diplomatic, and all your assets overseas as well. And that way you can actually get this um, reform going. And this is what other countries do. Uh, and other countries where we work with them, some successful ones, uh, they have very detailed plans. They go relentlessly on execution. They keep an eye on their uh, perform performance and then clearly change course as required. So I would finish by uh, three key messages. Number one, these transformations are long-term. Don't expect immediate outcomes, but do expect and try to deliver immediate quick wins to build confidence. Number two, be confident, be ambitious. And also ensure that you work together. This is not a choice. Economic development and economy will help you achieve your political and security objectives. Without it, it's going to be very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rashid, for sharing your thoughts on how to put together a very successful national transformation strategy. Rashid spoke about two or three key points. I think one of the things that he said right at the start uh, is really critical, which is it is very important to understand what do we want to be known as and for as a country. 
What is our purpose? He then spoke about relentless execution. And finally, he said that this can only happen through public-private partnership and a little bit of patience. So uh, as someone who's implemented strategies at a micro level, I could not agree with you more. So thank you very much for your thoughts.